I'm gonna show you how I control the temperature safely in a glass carboy, because some people have a hard time with that. So just uh, stay tuned. Everyone, welcome back to Scenic Sights and Bites. My name is Zach, if you're brand new to the channel, and uh, if you like what you see, I'd hope you'd click on the subscribe button and press that little bell so you get notified when new videos come out. Anyways, this is part two of our Let's Make Wine series. If you haven't seen part one, I'm gonna to link to that at the end of the video. Um, so part two is basically uh, the next step. So in part one, we went through cleaning, sterilization, uh, some of the tools you're gonna to need, and got the wine kit started, got the primary, primary fermentation going. Okay, now the primary fermentation in this particular wine kit, um, if I look at the instructions, it says keep it fermenting in the primary fermenter until day 14. And then after that, we do some uh, stabilizing and clearing and whatnot, preparing to bottle. Now, if you can't keep it for the full 14 days, um, or in our case, we're going to Mexico to make some videos, um, and our Mexico trip falls right in the middle of those 14 days. So because of that, um, we've got to make sure that uh, the wine is gonna be okay. If it sits in there too long after fermentation stops, air gets to it, and it's just gonna kind of ruin the flavor. So in this case here, we're gonna do fermentation in two stages. It's been fermenting since, uh, well, I guess now it is, it'll be come, going on 10 days in the primary fermenter. I'm gonna transfer that to a glass carboy um, that's gonna have an airlock on it, and that'll allow me to keep it in there for a couple more weeks, and uh, it'll finish fermenting in there. So what I'm gonna be showing in this video is talking about secondary fermentation, the tools you need, and how to do it. And I'll be showing you step-by-step uh, uh, step the different procedures to go. Because some wines that you're making, you're going to be racking the wine, and that's what you call it when you move it from the, the one um, primary fermenter to the to the secondary, or from one carboy to another. Um, that's racking the wine, okay? So uh, sometimes you have to do that several times when you're making wine, depending on how much sediment is going to, to uh, settle in the body. You want to get rid of that because ultimately your goal is to have clear, good tasting wine, okay? So what we're going to do now, I'm going to show you the wine, how it looks right now. I'm going to take the lid off the primary fermenter. The lid has not been on tight. Um, the lid's been sitting on just loose. So, you know, there's the, the gas can get out. There's enough air in there for the yeast to uh, start the fermentation process and whatnot. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Then we're going to go through some of the tools that I'm going to be using and uh, we're going to get it going. And then I'm going to show you how I control the temperature safely in a glass carboy because some people have a hard time with that. So, so I'm here cleaning the glass carboy, the uh, siphon, the hydrometer, the airlock, all that stuff that has to be cleaned and sanitized so I can uh, get this done. Oh, so these are our three puppies. We've got uh, Bella's the little brown floppy one. She's a Shih Tzu, Shih Tzu Poodle. And then we've got a black Yorkie, that's Mojo. And you can't see his face because he's so dark. And yeah, so Kilo is a uh, small bull mastiff. Bull mastiff kind of bred down with the bulldog again, I think. So um, yeah, so those are our three dogs. So now I've said before, when cleaning wine and whatnot, um, you want to keep this the, the chemicals and stuff away from dogs and kids because it can be quite harmful. So they like to hang out uh, wherever we are. And so I've got to you know keep chasing them out of here because if I spill any of that water on the floor or any of the uh, cleaning chemical, they could get into it and that would be uh, that would be really bad for them. Right now, the temperature is sitting kind of right between the 72 and the 75 uh, or the 22 and 24, depending on uh, if you're using Celsius or Fahrenheit. And that's perfect because the range you want to be in during the fermentation process is 20 to 25 or 68 to 77. Okay, so we're right in there. I had to move the belt up because it was getting too warm. So now let's just have a look inside. See lots of bubbles there. There was a lot of activity going on. And now the fermentation has definitely slowed down. Oh, yeah. You don't want to be taking the lid off a whole bunch because you don't want to introduce too much air into the wine because that's going to really change the taste. So that's what it looks like right now. The earlier stages of the fermentation, 
this would have been really foamy and thick, but you can see it's really calmed down now. So what I'm going to be doing, and everything I'm using has already been washed and sanitized, uh, the same way I showed you in part one of the video. I'm going to be checking the specific gravity using the hydrometer again, and I'll be using the wine thief to collect the wine so I don't have to dip the tube in the wine. I've got glass carboy sitting down here on the floor with a cup. Um, and I'll explain that in a moment. And I, the reason I like the setup I have is the carboy is low enough so that you can siphon it out. I don't have a pump, so I use a siphon so it's gotta be lower than the, the tub. The other thing is in the bottom of this barrel, and it's gonna be hard to see on the video, you can kind of maybe, yeah, you should be able to see it. You can see there's definitely a, a different appearance there. And that's all sediment from the wine and the yeast and, and everything else as it's been fermenting, that's all been settling. You, know, you don't want to get any of that in. So when we're racking it, I siphon it, but you've got to make sure you don't siphon some of that up. So the siphon I use, it's actually specially designed to um, sit at the bottom, but it doesn't suck right from the bottom of the tube. It kind of, um, it protects it so that it can sit on the sediment. You don't want to disturb the sediment, but it can sit on the sediment and just suck all the juices from above the sediment. And that's what I'm going to be using. And I will show you that right after I check the specific gravity. Okay, so I've put the wine in the tube. I've stuck the hydrometer in there and I can see that it's uh, two lines lower than the 90. So it's actually because the scale increases the lower you go. That would be 0.94. Okay. And that's actually for the 10 days it's been fermenting, uh, 0.94 is actually pretty good. So you can see, I can't really get to focus there. Um, you can, maybe you can see, I might be able to try and do this. There we go. So you can see the line there right below the red is, is 1.000 and the numbers get smaller as we go. So it was 0.94 was the specific gravity and I'm going to record that and then uh, we're going to let it ferment in the secondary carboy a little bit more. It doesn't really have much more to go. Um, and then uh, once I'm back from Cancun making a bunch of videos there, we are going to check it again and then we will be uh, doing stages of uh, stabilizing, degassing, clearing, and then we'll let it sit a few more days and we will uh, um, bottle it. So anyways, I'm going to get this siphoned out. I'm going to pour this wine back into the primary fermenter, or actually I could even pour it into the carboy if I was careful. It's got a pretty small neck though. And uh, yeah, and then we're going to put the rest of it into the, into the glass carboy, which is sitting right there. Now, the reason I have the cup, because when I first start to siphon it, um, the first few drops, first few tablespoons, I don't want... Uh, going in there. So I, I don't want going into the glass carboy. So I just discard those into the cup. And like I say, it's very, very small amount. It's just a few tablespoons. Okay. This is my siphon. This solid tube um, has a joint there where the flexible tube attaches to. That just makes it for easier cleaning. And the other end of it, it's quite long, right? So that it uh, will definitely be able to extend out uh, even larger primary fermenting buckets. This one here is a 30 liter bucket and it works perfect for winemaking. But you can see on the bottom, that red cap, see there's no hole at the bottom of the red cap. The holes are at the top, so facing away. So I can gently set this on the sediment without it sucking any of it up. The key is you don't want to disturb it. You don't want to move it too much because you want to have as little sediment going into the glass carboy as possible. So some people like to even, once they have it in place, they like to uh, anchor it or tape it in place. And that's a really good idea. It keeps it from moving when you're moving the hose around. Said the, uh, the hose is right down into the liquid so we don't introduce too much oxygen into that wine. Okay. And you can see it's going at a decent rate of speed. So once that's down there, um, we do lose a certain amount. Now, um, I've been asked this in the past, why don't I get the full amount of bottles that it should make in theory? 
Well, that's because the 30 bottles in theory, uh, you know, that includes all the sediment and everything else, which you don't bottle. So um, that's a theoretical amount based on the 23 liters, okay? So you always lose a bunch. Um, I typically lose a bottle and a bit. Um, I would rather lose a bottle and a half uh, or even a bottle and three quarters and have zero sediment in my wine than end up with a half a bottle that's gritty and nasty, right? So just make sure you don't suck any of that up. So what, you're short a little bit, at least what you have is gonna be, be really, really good. Explain this again a little bit more here. For the secondary fermentation, um, I might've actually said uh, 0.94, it's actually 0.994. So just to be clear, that's 0.994. Um, that's when I'm starting my secondary fermentation. It is day 10, and that's because day 14 would have fallen in the middle of my holiday. So by doing this, we can keep it in there much, much longer and it will be fine. And you can see, according to their chart, um, now this is a four-week kit. And so the starting specific gravity for the four-week kit is right there. They're saying it should be in that range. And at the point where I'm stabilizing should be less than 0.996. So we're actually at 0.994. I could probably stabilize it now early. Um, I've never tried doing that. I'm not going to try now. I'm just going to deal with this and then, you know, uh, probably be ready for stabilizing when we get back in a week. Okay, so you can see it's just getting to the very end. I did tip the bucket ever so slightly. Um, I just put a small prop under it and I did that very slowly so as not to disturb the sediment. And the reason I did that was just to try and get a little bit more liquid above the edge of the the uh, sediment in there, it actually looks like it's going to start sucking some sediment, so I'm going to stop that flow. Got a lock there. I do not want uh, that stuff getting in the carboy if I can help it. Um, and for sure, once we get to the wine bottling stage, we don't want it in there. Okay, would have been nice to be a little bit higher. The less air you have in there, the better. But uh, we're going to put an airlock on this, and fermentation is going to push some of that out, some of the gases out, anyways. And that will the airlock will let that go out, but prevent any air from coming in. So it'll be fine. Fine. You can actually get handles that clip to the neck, and they're designed for lifting the carboys up. You can also get straps that go underneath um, to support the bottom while you lift it. So there's a lot of good options up there if you don't want to grab it. The biggest thing is make sure it's not slippery when you do it, because you would hate to drop that. Now, I'm, one of the other items I've, I've talked about is an airlock. So this is an airlock, um, and that's a bung. Now, this particular bung is uh, made out of silicone. And now, with that, it works great, but the inside of that neck has to be perfectly dry, and the bung has to be perfectly dry. So after you clean it, you have to let it air dry or, or make sure you dry it off first. So what happens is the gases are going to come up through the tube, and they're going to push that little cap up a little bit. Um, and the air is going to come out and bubble through this solution that is here. This solution is just slightly below the surface of the tube. That solution, uh, just to keep everything sterile, that is a potassium metasulfite. And the gas is going to come out. It's going to escape through the water, come up. There are tiny little holes in this plastic cap, and that's going to let the gases escape. This solution will prevent any air from going through the water, through the tube, and filling up in here. So that's a very important step, and that's how that works. Now, the, I've got the glass carboy here. Now, if this was a nice warm room, the proper temperature, I could just leave it like this. But because it's not, we have to still keep this at a proper temperature. Now, the heat belt, some people will put heat belt right on a glass carboy. Even though these are good ones, they're not cheap glass carboys, there is still the potential for them to shatter if you put a heat belt on. I haven't heard of that happening to anybody I know, but I have heard of it happening to other people that I don't know. So I'm not, I'm not gonna take the chance. I don't want 23 liters of um, wine all over my floor. So earlier, I promised you I would tell you how to keep your wine at the right temperature using a heat belt without letting the heat belt touch the glass. Now, you might be thinking we're gonna shove something underneath the belt. Well, it's not quite like that. And I'm sure you're all familiar with double boiling. This is kind of the same idea. What have I done here? I've taken the primary fermenter, I cleaned it, because I only have one. If you have two, it's a lot easier. But I cleaned it up, and then I 
had the uh, glass carboy placed inside of it and then I ran some water at the approximate temperature of where I want it to be and filled it up to right around the 25 liter mark thereabouts. You just want to have it full enough so that the water is a little bit higher than the heat belt. Um, and what you're doing is you're heating up the water and the water is heating up the glass carboy. So it's like a double boiler. Um, you're indirectly keeping that wine at the proper temperature and it works absolutely fantastic. The only downfall is if I want to make another wine right now and I only have the one primary fermenter tub, I can't do it because I'm using this in this uh, capacity. And this is how it's going to sit until it's time to do the stabilizing, degassing, and clearing. I hope you've enjoyed part two of Let's Make Wine. Remember, click that red subscribe button and hit that bell so that you get notified when the new videos come out. I will see you for part three, and hopefully you'll tune in and continue to watch as we make some videos um, from some restaurants that we're going to, one that we actually went to today in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, um, as well in our trip to Cancun. We'll be documenting that and showing you around, seeing what's what, finding the best taco places, the best places to get a pina colada, um, it's going to be a good time. So make sure you subscribe and tune in and we'll see you there.